Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yes. Very good. I haven't got a clue what you said in that introduction, but I'm assuming it was nice. I don't know. Now, you're all a very long way away, which gives me the assumption that you perhaps think I bite, um, or perhaps I'm really rather dangerous in some way. But I can assure you that really isn't the case, unless, of course, you are an unelected European commissioner or official, uh, in which case, yes, you are very much my enemy. Now, it's come to my attention that the University of Ghent has recently awarded honorary doctorates to two of my least favourite people in the world, uh, Mr. Barroso and, of course, my great mate, Herman Van Rompuy. So I know that this evening um, I'm not going to be awarded an honorary doctorate or anything of the kind, but I want to say thank you very much for inviting me along this evening, for having the opportunity to come and address you. Um, I am aware that my comments are seen in some courses to be controversial, subversive, dangerous, um, but I'd like you to approach what I have to say with an open mind, um, and I'll give my presentation, we'll have some questions, and you will leave, I hope tonight, understanding that there is another point of view. And in a sense, that's how I got involved in politics in the first place. I had never had any aspirations to get involved in politics at all. I went to work in the city of London in the early 1980s when we had the great fortune, in my opinion, to have a Prime Minister, our first female Prime Minister, in Margaret Thatcher. Somebody who believed in free markets, who believed in wealth creation, who believed in low taxes, who believed in incentives, and I rushed into this city of London, this global financial marketplace, and I was the original yuppie, you know, with a great big mobile phone that was about this big, and I used to, by the age of 22 or 23, I was earning fantastic sums of money, though I was spending even more in the nightclubs every evening, and, and that was my life. And I was going to spend my life as a proper capitalist, and the ambition and the aim was to make as much money as I possibly could, and to have a good time. And what got me into politics was one day in 1990, and it had been a fairly quiet day on the exchanges, and I was in my usual bar uh, in the city, uh, tanking into the gin and tonics, or whatever it was, when somebody came in, a runner came in, and said, breaking news, Britain has decided to join the exchange rate mechanism. Now what that meant is that Britain had decided to go into stage two of a three-stage process of economic and monetary union, which you now know <coughs> as the Euro. And I was opposed to Britain going into the Euro. I was opposed to us joining the ERM and pegging sterling against the Deutschmark. And I won't tell you uh, what my initial utterances were that evening, but suffice to say they were uh, fairly liberally dosed with Anglo-Saxon. Um, and I, I, I just thought, you know, they've all gone bloody mad. I mean, how can sterling be pegged against the Deutschmark? We're a different country. We have a different economy. We have different interest rates. We're at different stages of the business cycle. We have different patterns of trade across the world. Germany has stronger patterns of trade within Europe. And I was absolutely convinced from day one that this was going to be a disaster. Well, it didn't take very long. Because within two years, we had interest rates in Britain that were exactly double what they should have been. We had a year in 92 of record house repossessions, of record business bankruptcies, um, and, and, and we had a million people, one million extra people in Britain, were put onto the unemployment register as part of this crazy idea that somehow Britain was a European country. Now, I thought then, if the Conservatives support it, if Labour supports it, if the Lib Dems support it, if the entire political class supports it, I don't support it, and I'm going to do something about it. And I, next time round, will not be made to vote for these people, I will put myself up for election. So that, for me, is how the whole thing started. I got involved in this on the economics of it. I got involved in this believing that Britain was not suited for economic and monetary union. And I'll come 
make an Oliver talk to that principle perhaps applied more deeply to Northern European and Southern European countries. So that was it. <clears throat> I was hooked on the politics. But please, if there are those of you who've come along tonight expecting to hear an anti-European rant, then I'm very sorry, but I'm going to have to disappoint you. Because I am not anti-European in any way at all. I'm married to a German, I've worked for two French companies, and I've drunk more Spanish Rioja than most people alive in Britain today. I love Europe, but what is wonderful about this continent of Europe, what makes it a more fascinating, more interesting place than America or Australia, is that we can go within a relatively short distance, let's say 100 miles, oh no sorry you've got kilometers here haven't you, and we, we, we can go at a relatively short distance and we can find different peoples, speaking different languages, eating different foods, doing things differently. What we should be saying is vive la différence. It's wonderful that we have this diversity in Europe, but what is objectionable is this thing that masquerades as Europe, namely the European Union, which is trying to bring together 27 different peoples speaking 21 different languages, with completely different economies, histories and cultures. They're trying to push them all into one new European state. <clears throat> and they're doing it, in my view, without the consent of the people. Now, let's return to the economics. Uh, we have a European Union. We now have a Eurozone. How well I remember when the Euro was launched, the big fireworks display that happened in Brussels, the usual champagne receptions, and this was going to be the new dawn, that somehow, if everybody had the same currency, and the same interest rates, and the same central bank, it was going to lead to huge prosperity. Well, here we are, in the midst of a massive Euro crisis. It was obvious from day one, that just as I realised, back in 1990, that Britain could not be pegged against the Deutschmark, it was obvious from 1999 onwards, <clears throat> that Greece never fitted the criteria. That in fact, they fiddled the figures, they fiddled what was then known as the Maastricht criteria, so desperate were they to get Greece involved in the Euro. And what we've now seen with Greece is we've seen a bailout. What we're witnessing um, on the Greek streets are massive, huge, violent demonstrations and protests. We're witnessing the beginnings of terrorism, pinprick terrorism against EU targets within Greece, and a very, angry, a very angry populace. The same, of course, has happened in Ireland. Ireland, which for 500 years had fought against the British. <clears throat> My press officer here is an Irish nationalist, and we disagree on little bits of history from time to time, but never mind. But where Herman and I do agree is that Ireland had enjoyed her own independence, had enjoyed her own self-government for a relatively small, short period of time. She joined the Euro at a time when her, when her economy was booming, at a time when her economy was overheating. And so the Irish situation is different to the Greek situation, but it's similar in this one respect, that again, Ireland wasn't fitted, wasn't suited to being part of the economic and monetary union, to having the euro, and what Ireland had for the first seven years of the euro, she had interest rates that were three to four percent lower than they should have been. So the speculative housing boom that was taking place, particularly in Dublin and the surrounds, was magnified by what was effectively free money. She's now been bailed out. It is only a matter of time before Portugal is bailed out. Now, What's the future for these countries? I am in no doubt that the best thing that could happen to Greece, to Ireland, to Portugal, and perhaps ultimately to Spain, the best thing that could happen is if they bust out of economic and monetary union, if they default on some element of their debts, and if they go back to having their own national currencies with a significant short-term devaluation. I am in no doubt that that's their future. <coughs> But our lords and masters, the prime ministers of all of our nations, who's going from Belgium, of course, I'm not actually sure, um, but they're all going to, and I'll come back to Belgium, don't you worry. 
But the Prime Ministers of all our nations are getting together on Thursday and Friday of this week in Brussels because they now want to change the treaty. They want to amend Article 136 because they know that actually bailing out Eurozone countries was illegal under the treaty and wasn't allowed and the rules have been broken. And four brave German professors are taking Angela Merkel to the German Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe to declare these bailouts illegal and Merkel knows they're going to win in the German court, which is why they've got to, to, to change the treaty. So whichever way you look at it, economic and monetary union is not a success. And if they're able, by Friday evening, to have agreed a permanent bailout fund, to have agreed to um, e e effectively keep imprisoned countries that were never fitted into joining EMU in the first place, then I'm afraid um, far from this being good news on Friday night, it will actually be disastrous news. Absolutely disastrous news for Ireland, Greece, Portugal and perhaps even Spain. Because those countries will remain trapped inside something that they should not be a part of. Now I could go on about the economics because actually what we're doing is we're building what we call a social market model in Europe. And that means we keep passing legislation that says we have to have extended maternity rights. We have to have extended paternity rights. We must all be paid a decent minimum working wage. We must all have a sensible allowance of holidays. <clears throat> it all sounds great, doesn't it? It all sounds wonderful and civilised and sensible until you start to add on top of that the health and safety regulations. You know, to change a light bulb now in Britain um, you first, if, if this is happening in a factory, to change a light bulb in Britain under EU law, you now first have to conduct a risk assessment. <laughs> you then have to examine uh, whether you're qualified to climb up a ladder. I, I'm not joking. Um, and if you do, there must be at least two people to help you do it. Now, I've no doubt that over the years, changing light bulbs in factories, people have been hurt. I've no doubt about it. But do we actually need the state, the European state at every level, to codify all of this? Then, of course, we have on top of that, and even worse, the whole environmental regulations. Now, it may be, it may be that CO2 emissions are leading to global warming. I don't know. I'm not a scientist, but I do note that actually global temperatures are somewhat cooler today than they were in 1998. And yet we've set up, through the EU, a mechanism that actually guarantees we will de-industrialise Europe. Uh, why do I say that? I'll give you an example. Big, um, big steel firm called Chorus, owned by a massive um, an Indian magnet called Mr. Mattel, they had a plant up in Redcar in the northeast of England. They have just closed down in Redcar. Thank you, it's only water, how dull, but never mind. <laughs> they just closed down in Redcar. They closed down the steel plant in Redcar, and for doing that, the taxpayer is paying them carbon credits of £300 million. So for closing down a factory, for putting a couple of thousand people out of work, for stopping steel manufacture in the northeast of England, this giant multinational called Chorus has earned three hundred million pounds. And what have they done? They just reopened that same steel production in India. So the net effect on CO2 emissions is zero. But what we've actually done as taxpayers, as part of this crazy European Union environmental scheme, is we have paid, in this case, the northeast of England, a company in the northeast of England to de-industrialise us and move us out to the east. Every single time the European Parliament approves a directive that has been given to us by the European Commission, I can hear in the distance Indian and Chinese businesses roaring with approval. You know, we're not going to have, if we go on like this, the European marketplace, which currently represents 18% of the GDP of the globe, well, um, it's projected to be 9% by 2020, 
frankly, it could best part disappear. This is not an economic model that works. But if that wasn't serious enough, there's something I think that matters far, far more than that. And that is the complete absence of democracy within this system.